The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond Sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. My name is Josh Burkus. I'm going to talk about ways to wreck your database. Um, the, uh, how, to, how to wreck your relational database. Now, you may ask why would I want to destroy my database. There's a variety of reasons for that. Yes. Like, for example, you might want revenge against your boss. Or you might want to guarantee yourself job security because nobody else knows how the database works. Or maybe you hate the project you're on and you want to ensure that it fails. Or maybe you just want to hide all the bodies by making the data inaccessible. Or maybe you want to make sure that you can come back later and get back into the database whenever you want to. Or maybe you think it's time for a refactor and you want to make sure that it happens. <laughs> or maybe you feel like the application is just too darn fast and you want it to be a little bit slower. Um, or maybe you just want to get your revenge on those stupid developers who keep asking you for things. So, give you 10 methods to lose data, be insecure, become unmaintainable, stifle changes, and make everyone miserable. That's kind of interesting. Huh. Let's not worry about it. Let's not worry about it. I use lots of big text. And make everyone miserable. So, method number one. Number one is what I call the one big spreadsheet method of database design. This is where all of the data in your database is in a single table with 1,800 different nullable fields, completely denormalized. This is also known as zeroth normal form. Yes. Yep. 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 Thanks, thanks to the popularity of Excel, and, and this, by the way, actually is, in fact, a real table design from real application, um, the, um, a, including a column called question mark, question mark, question mark. Um, the, um, so um, this is generally the result of taking an Excel spreadsheet and converting it directly into a database so that you can harness the power of the database in order to produce Excel spreadsheets. Um, our second one that's a, big, that's a big favorite of mine from a maintainability perspective is random naming. Because one of the big debates in the database world is should table names be plural or singular? I say use a mix. Some tables should be plural and some tables should be singular. That way you have to check every time. But but plural and singular isn't quite enough to really obfuscate your database design. You need to also randomly mix underscore and camel case. Extra bonus points if you have a table called user profile and profile user, both the same That's pretty good. Okay. Yep. Um, yeah, user profile and, and, and also have user underscore profile. Right. <laughs> yes. So let's mix our camel cases and underscores. But we're not limited to messing with table names, yeah? Yeah? I thought I had a misspelling on here. Oh, well. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Well, and, and also you're not limited to table names. We can also do field names. Um, so, you know, you can apply the same principles. We can mix camel case and underscores. Um, I like actually um, putting in some abbreviations, a little bit of Hungarian notation. Um, the, um, and, you know, in other things, uh, random sort of acronyms that have been capitalized in the table name, so they have to be quoted. Um, you know, these, these are all fun. Of course, the, the ultimate random naming technique is, of course, um, as perpetuated by Microsoft, uh, Hungarian notation. Nothing like having every field in the database begin something with, with uh, a data type 
annotation because of course you couldn't look that up in the system tables. Yeah. <laughs> well, that makes an alpha sort really easy. Right. And and actually and and for 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 I'll give the bonus points in this for the bonus points in this use Hungarian notation but don't be consistent about it. So for example, on some fields use use str and in others use txt. Yes. Yep. Yep. So Techniques three and four are sort of a pair. Um, uh, these go together uh, under the title, we don't need no stinking keys. Um, the first one is, first of all, your table should have no real keys. Um, just an auto number. Everything else should be completely, you know, unsorted. Because, you know, you don't really want an authenticating key. And that way, you can get fun stuff like this. Um, you know, we got, uh, let's see, I'm in mean, here is Josh Burkus and Joshua Burkus and Josh Burkus and Josh Burkus and a variety of different email names. We don't really need any sort of uniqueness constraints across any of this. The users will sort it out eventually. Uh huh. The, um, yeah, well, this is, this is the bonus, this is the bonus LinkedIn technique. Yeah. Yep. This is the bonus LinkedIn technique. Yep. Our second key technique is, of course, since we're not going to have any real unique keys, we're not going to have any foreign keys either. Um, <laughs> the, um, so, you know, with our usual, wow, that's, that's actually sort of an interesting color effect here. There's actually text here. Um, the, um, so, you know, this way, one of the nice things about having no foreign keys is that we can then have fun with orphan rows, where, where things can become completely orphan, and that way they show up on one count and not on the others. The, um, the other really fun thing about not having any foreign keys in the database is then developers feel compelled to implement them in the application, which of course works great. Oh, that's always fun. That's, that's called the overloading a field, which I'll get into. <laughs> the, um, yes, implementing your own auto number primary key in application code, that's always fun, too. The, um, but, you know, you look at this sort of thing, and if you insert and there and that sort of thing, you update, what could possibly go wrong? Technique number five, no, no constraints, of course, either. You know, everything should be in unlimited length text field. Um, you shouldn't have any constraints on requiring things to be null or not null. These are all confusing and you'll have to change them later. Now, a lot of people say, yes, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yep, but he's not here, you notice, yep. Um, the, um, now, a lot of people say, oh, okay, well, you know, I need some constraints on this, so I'll just do stuff as Vercare with a length limit. The length limit is not terrifically useful because, you know, we put this in here and we sort of fit this in and then we can have fun stuff in here like this um, where we have, you know, first name and last name are null. We have sort of random values in some fields. <laughs> oh, you just noticed the third row? <laughs> the, um, you know, uh, you know, and, and you have all kinds of garbage in the database, and that way you have to check every row for garbage when you're in your application code. This adds lots of extra code to the application and, and makes everything fun. Yes, exactly. Um, and that means you're going to assign somebody full time to cleaning up the data. Continuously, full employment plan. So now, no constraints is relatively easy. What's a lot more fun because people often think things are okay until they learn they're not okay, is to use more subtle techniques like non-atomic fields. 
You know, this is always fun. Like, for example, a name field that has somebody's complete name, so you have to actually parse it every time you want to read a portion out of it, like, like alphabetizing a list of people where the name is in one field. That's always a lot of fun. Um, now, that's the obvious kind of non-atomic field. But the non-obvious kind of non-atomic field is, is actually different, and this is a lot more fun, which is where you have something like a status column, and the status actually represents two or three independent variables. So for example, this is a status column from, again, a real database I worked on, um, where, where we have a status column, and A was active, um, and I was inactive. Uh, well, actually, A was administrator, U was user, and I was inactive. So it's always fun, for example, with that thing, right, active, uh, uh, administrator, uh, user, inactive. What if I wanted to look up all the inactive administrators? What would I do there exactly? Of course, the best non-atomic fields are the ones that are encoded in standards so you can defend them as a way of supporting you know, the standard way of doing things. For example, charts of accounts, ultimate non-atomic field. Gen frequently, your chart of account will represent six or seven independent variables in the corporation's accounting. Um, and you know what? Very important, make this part of the unique key to various tables. So you can be changing it all the time um, as stuff gets allocated between accounts. Um, so non-atomic fields are fun. The other thing that's fun, which is actually sort of a specialty version of non-atomic fields, um, are what are known as magic numbers. Uh, this is a very popular one. Right, yeah. You know, when you want to actually, like you've got a foreign key to another table. Like, this is always fun. You have a foreign key to another table, and uh, for example, another database, right? Voter database. They wanted to indicate people that were no longer voters, um, and they didn't have useful demographic information on. So every, all of the records from these unknown voters got associated with a single voter whose ID was zero. So then pretty soon you do something like, you know, non-knowledgeably, you go into the table and you attempt to do, say, an average of the number of voters per household over the table and you discover the average is something like 67. And you're like, what the hell? And it's that one ID zero voter who has 3,000 people in their household. And so then you have to remember to exempt that ID, uh, zero voter, from every single query. Now, the next magic number is for, your, for, for the, the MySQL folks here. That's always fun. That makes it really fun to do any date calculations. Um, you know, you have to remember, oh, yeah, we're really losing stuff off the bottom, aren't we? The, um, yep. So this makes it always really fun because you have to do this fun date calculation to exempt, uh, to exempt the, the February 30th. This is very popular in, in, in I've seen in my SQL applications to be a zero date for the year. Um, at least in some of the ones that I've had to troubleshoot. Now, no, the problem is that it's just not displaying. No, it's just a defective projector. Yep. So um, now there's other things you do magic numbers. For example, uh, again, working with demographic information, working with the city of San Francisco, actually, at the time, this project is long dead, so I can actually talk about it. Um, they want to do something like, for example, the number of people in a household for this household survey but they wanted to represent some special values, like, for example, um, people, uh, they wanted to represent people that hadn't been surveyed yet and people who chose decline to state. So we added some magic numbers to indicate that, because like one of them, uh, you know, uh, declined to state was, you know, negative one and could not estimate was 100 because, you know, nobody would ever have 100 people in their household. Um, up until, you know, you get to a Berkeley commune. But the, um, and of course, this was lots of fun when it came time to write queries to do statistics on households, which was the purpose of this database. 
So you had to remember to add this clause to every single freaking query. Um, so that made things lots of fun. And you know, you see other magic numbers. This one's popular in accounting stuff. You know, um, this was the, the most fun thing at all because this was in another database. You go in, the invoice, negative one cent was to indicate an invoice that you weren't supposed to send because it was a no-op invoice. Well, of course, somebody goes into the system, new bookkeepers hired there that said, look, hey, we've got all of these invoices that haven't gone out for months and months, so I'm just going to print them all and send them out. So 18,000 customers got invoices for negative one cent. So the most important thing about magic numbers, though, if you really want to have fun with magic numbers, document them only in the application code. They should not be annotated anywhere else. Preferably, don't even document them in the application code. Yeah. yeah. Well, sometimes you have to actually figure out what you're doing. The, um, so, now, even more advanced technique, again in the non-atomic field realm, because that's where we can have the most fun, is what we call polymorphic fields. Um, this is from a fundraising database where the contents of preferred contact, the valid range of values for preferred contact was dependent on what was in the account type field. And the contact info field was dependent on what was in the preferred contact field. Yeah. So for example, trying to assemble an email list out of this. Yes. This was a real database. It was in production. <laughs> The, um, I mean, it's, it's pretty clear what happened here. They started with a spreadsheet, and they just put the spreadsheet straight in the database. The, um, it, would be a, it would have been a nightmare even as a spreadsheet, though. So that's really fun because nobody, nobody other than you can friggin' figure out what's going on here. Now, the much more common technique for, um, for making your database unmaintainable and slowing performance to a crawl um, is taking a relational database and implementing entity attribute value on it. And I'm not talking about for extended options. I mean, everybody has EAV for, oh, you know, I want to allow you know, users to add preferences and that sort of thing. No. No, put your core data, the stuff you're going to be running aggregation on, the stuff that should be part of your unique keys, and put that all in EAV. Because, of course, your row-based relational database performs great when the entire database is reduced to a surrogate key, a category, and a value. Yes. Well, and of course, there's, there's no limit on this category field. <laughs> Make up your own. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, <laughs> you can be very tall, or very short, or very tall. <laughs> No, 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 see, that would be an improvement. That would be an improvement over this model, actually. That would be an improvement over this model. Because right now, right now for this, the application can legitimately insert something like blue for height. And the database will accept it. And then later on, you have to figure out what height blue means. Of course, of course now that we're living in the era of document databases, you can, of course, whoops, what happened to that? Hold on. Uh, oh, right. So, for example, here's some fun things to do with the AV databases that have been denormalized to this extent. Say, write a query to say, how many men have brown hair and are over six feet? Or make marital status and age required, but not other things. Or apply constraints to field values. These are all fun things to do. Um, and this actually, this design was a complete EAV, um, I, dating site design, where they were, in fact, trying to answer these questions and trying to answer them thousands of times per second. Now, of course, in the age of document databases and scripting and all kinds of other technology, we have a, a more modern version of EAV, which is eBlob. And that's where you take all of your data and put it in a big delimited text field of some kind, XML, JSON, whatever, put all of your core data in there. Um, that way, there's no constraints at all. Um, 
there's no way to enforce any kind of data types or any requirements. Um, and you know, at that point, your work as a database designer is pretty much done. You have table, which is called table, and just put whatever you want to into it. Now on the opposite side of this, there's another lazy man's technique to wrecking your database, which is give complete control of database design and construction to the ORM. Those ORMs were written Yep. Right, those ORMs were written by smart people. They can design a database from scratch with no problems, particularly over several generations of application code iteration. Yes. Yep. So, um, and the lovely thing about this is this will give you a nice complicated database. Again, full employment guaranteed. So, 10 ways. Uh, one big spreadsheet, random naming, no keys, no foreign keys, no constraints non-atomic fields, magic numbers, polymorphic fields, EAV and eBlob, um, and of course, relying heavily on the ORM. Um, you know, there's, you can always take the opposite techniques if you want uh, a database that actually works, if you want a, a database that actually works, but um, that's no fun at all. What? Well, it's because that's the answer, that's the answer to all of these things, is atomic fields. Yes. Atomic fields, atomic fields, atomic fields. No, really. It's like location, it's like location, location, location. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and the administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Astros. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Astro Space Systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Astro or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Astro. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems 
and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a, a thing that really shows the power of the you know of the open source community. It is global, and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Is, uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail, and CloudStack is designed to handle number one that mass scale. Number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support. Uh, different network models. You can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack well, management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack, they were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the cloud stack.